Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Vargas, and I'm the director of the Better Climate Challenge here at the U.S. Department of Energy. Welcome to all of you today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Before we get started, we just want to remind everyone that today's meeting is being recorded. So we do plan to post this on DOE's website, both the audio and the visual. So please keep that in mind. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. Secretary. Great. Thank you, Maria. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the launch of our Better Climate Challenge. I know that many of you uh, tuning in represent our inaugural partners. I'm really just floored by the size of this group. Over 80 of you, ranging from manufacturers and retailers to to local and county governments and to higher education and healthcare and, and many more in between, simply outstanding. So let me begin by saying thank you. This effort holds enormous potential because of you. And I've no doubt that together we're gonna to tap into every bit of that potential. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what these folks are, are partnering with us on, let me just briefly explain what the Better Climate Challenge is and why it asks our partners to do something special. So as you might've guessed, it starts with the climate crisis. Um, we all know that our planet is on fire. Our hair should be on fire too, because this moment demands action. And this challenge requires big collective action. And that's what the Better Climate Challenge is aiming to unleash, collective action. So over the last decade, the Department of Energy has focused on public-private partnerships to raise energy efficiency in the nation's homes and buildings and industrial plants as part of the Better Buildings Initiative. And now we're gonna use that experience to broaden the ambition across the economy, starting with you, our inaugural partners. So you're all here because you've been, you are part of an incredible group that's stepped up to a very big challenge. You've committed to cut your operational greenhouse gas emissions at least in half within 10 years. And that means everything within the fences, the heating, the cooling, ventilation, lighting for buildings, the cars and trucks in fleets, the electricity you use, and more. So if each of you pulls these reductions off, it is going to be an impressive feat on its own. But what makes this even a bigger deal is your commitment to sharing the details and the data to demonstrate how you did it. So we, we especially want to know where you're getting stuck, because if you are getting stuck, then others are probably getting stuck too. But together, we're going to be able to figure out what works, what actually needs work, what that tells us about the way going forward. And that is going to allow us to illuminate pathways for emissions reductions that similar organizations are gonna be able to follow. And that's the kind of collective action that we actually do need right now. Of course, we know that from 10 years of the Builder, Bitter, <laughs> the Better Buildings Challenge initiative, in those 10 years, we've learned that that is not gonna be easy. I mean, change like this always comes with challenges and some of those challenges are gonna be technical. Some are going to be financial or organizational. Some uh, may be local in nature, others regional, others national, but we're gonna face them head on in collaboration. Each of you are gonna bring your progress and your experience to the table. And at DOE, we bring technical and market expertise along with cutting edge research from DOE's national labs. And together we will develop real world solutions that others can replicate throughout all of your respective sectors. And then that will mean that we can accelerate our progress toward net zero emissions. So I've got more to say to you, but our phenomenal group of inaugural partners uh, uh, I want to excite, I'm excited to continue this conversation, but first I want to introduce a very special guest speaker, my friend and colleague and our 18th secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to join Secretary Granholm, the president's climate advisor, Gina McCarthy, and all of you for this very important event. Thank you all for rising to meet the challenge and setting this ambitious goal for your properties. You all should know that DOE and HUD already work closely together on many fronts, 
on energy codes, low-income housing, weatherization, solar energy, advanced building construction, and through the build, build, yeah, through the buildings <laughs> challenge. I'm sorry, I'm like you, Secretary. Uh, we are delighted to partner with DOE on this initiative as well. HUD is dedicated to lowering the carbon footprint and energy expenses in the affordable housing sector, which has been historically overlooked in relation to other infrastructure investments. Of the partners accepting this challenge, seven are public housing and multifamily partners, representing a bright future for more than 40,000 families. This challenge is more than an opportunity to cut our carbon emissions and make good on the Biden administration's goal of cutting carbon pollution in half by 2030. It also represents our commitment to the communities that all too often bear the brunt of climate change while seeing too few of the benefits from the energy transition. One of the reasons we are interested in this work is that HUD funds billions of dollars in disaster recovery work in cities and towns devastated by natural disasters annually. We see the impacts firsthand and the years it takes to rebuild after these climate events. So the more we can do now on the climate mitigation front, the less we will have to spend on rebuilding our communities later. As we have seen over the course of the Better Buildings Challenge, federal support for voluntary initiatives like this can have a tremendous impact on our future way of doing business and to drive innovation and change. We also see the value that comes from public and private partnerships. Looking forward to the next decade, this relationship is important. It will ensure that you and your peers have the support you need to be market leaders. Thank you again for your commitment and your leadership. And I will now turn it over to Climate Advisor, Gina McCarthy. Well, first of all, uh, it's exciting to be here. Uh, thank you to Secretary Granholm and her amazing team for pulling this challenge together. And obviously to Secretary Fudge for her continued uh, great representation uh, of this administration to the outside world in critical areas in which I forgot climate that I change. Was, I forgot it was live. Secretary, you may want to go on mute there. Okay, all set. Uh, but I really want to thank them all for showing their commitment and to all of you for your commitment to climate and clean energy, together with your companies our workers and our customers will be better off. And it's an exciting moment. This better climate challenge, and I nailed that, uh, is a truly exciting challenge. It's a rallying cry, which is why this round table is such a terrific idea. Even if we aren't able to get together in person, we can start feeding off of one another with some positive hope and energy because there are so many exciting opportunities. And I've had so far, some wonderful opportunities as President Biden's first national climate advisor. But it's really gatherings like this that show what our country is really all about and our shared understanding of the challenges that we're facing, like this climate crisis. It's a clear understanding that we must be all in together. And this is what gives me hope every single day, and I'm sure it does with you as well. With partners like Secretary Granholm and Secretary Fudge, I can't help but be amazed at the energy and the passion across the administration. And I'm so excited about the progress that we've already made. We've taken hundreds of executive actions to advance climate solutions across every sector of the economy. And through the bipartisan infrastructure law, President Biden secured historic investments in climate priorities, like upgrading our power grid, which everybody needs, and funding innovative demonstration projects on clean energy technologies that are really going to open up exciting opportunities for all of us. You know, we are also walking the walk across our federal operations. Just like you all, we have committed to reduce our emissions from our federal building portfolio by 50% in the next 10 years. This is part of President Biden's federal sustainability plan, which covers everything that we purchase and operate. And the entire federal government is engaged because our administration knows what you know, that leadership really matters. And as we lead by example, we can show that it's possible to rapidly reduce emissions 
and to deliver huge benefits like new good paying jobs in engineering and manufacturing and construction and logistics and more as we upgrade our buildings and our factories and more affordable energy for families as we support innovation on efficiency and clean electricity and more that unlocks new solutions and bring down the cost and environmental justice for the communities that have long been overburdened by pollution who will breathe easier as we clean up our air and our water. So there are great opportunities for all of us to seize, not just the climate benefits, but the economic benefits and the equity benefits as we focus on investing in communities that have been left behind. And let's not forget, smart, innovative climate action has overwhelming support from the American people. Your constituents and states and local governments, your customers in the private sector are all looking to lead the way. And you are standing tall by making sure that they know what your values are and where you are heading. You are showing them an example that I hope will attract well more than 80 or 90 companies to join in. So just think, Only a short time ago, the federal government decided to disinvest in climate leadership at the federal level, but that didn't stop our country from pushing forward because organizations, businesses, and other levels of government stepped up. And today, we are all working together from the federal government on down and on out to make a big leap forward. And together, with President Biden's leading a federal mobilization and with partners like you, making progress on the ground, I know that we will go further and faster than ever before. But I also know this moment will demand a lot from all of you as leaders. So thank you for answering that call and for being part of a wave of climate action that's going to make life better for all of us today, our businesses, our workers, our communities, our families, better for our health, safety, and security, and even better for our pocketbooks in our country's economy as we embrace our clean energy future. And with that, let me hand it back to our fearless leader, Secretary Granholm, who's going to kick off the discussion. All right, Tina, you did nail it. Thank you, my dear. I appreciate your energy. And thanks for really kind of taking a step back and putting the initiative in full context. And of course, thank you as well to Secretary Fudge for pointing, pointing out how important this work is for our nation's multifamily homes and just what a difference this can mean in our in our efforts to make the clean energy future just and equitable for all. So um, I wanna speak uh, directly to our inaugural partners right now and, and just tell you that you are really part of an elite group. You stand out, not just in your, in your respective sectors, but in this, this world spanning effort to overcome one of the most pressing crises, crises really, we've ever faced. For, for many of you, climate action is, is nothing new, but whether you are staking out your first big opportunity to get involved or whether you're raising uh, your ambitions even further, you really are demonstrating real leadership. And I'd like nothing more than to recognize each and every one of you individually. But the thing is, there are so many of you that it would just, it would take all of our our time. And that's a testament to how remarkable this group is. But what we're going to do is show who's involved. So let's show it. Look at all those logos. I mean, what stands out to me is that you represent this broad cross-section of the U.S. economy with, look at all of them, with a range of sectors and and subsectors that are really vital to climate and clean energy goals. Every step that you all take toward reaching your better climate challenge commitment is one that the rest of your sectors and your subsectors might follow. You are trailblazers and we all thank you for stepping up, for taking this on, for embracing really accountability. So on behalf of all of us at the Department of Energy, we are honored and we are eager to join with you on this journey. We look forward to helping you work through the challenges. We look forward to knocking down the barriers with you, to seizing the opportunities ahead with you. We cannot wait to see how your efforts, your leadership really, will inspire others. And then I also want to recognize the executives that are tuning in today. You know, again, all too many to name. So you can see on the screen 
we can pull that up, who's joining us today. And I know that many of your teams who are going to be so pivotal to this work are also watching. I want to applaud all of you for taking this collective climate action. And I also want to acknowledge that you've taken a bit of a leap of faith. But I, I believe that these steps that you'll be taking to meet your commitments are going to pay off and they're going to boost your bottom line. You're going to do good for the planet. You're going to do good for our future by doing good for your companies, for your schools and local governments. So thank you for all of that and for joining us today. I know we've got lots of fruitful conversations ahead of us, and we're going to kick off those fruitful conversations today with just a, a few partners who are working within this broad scope of great inaugural partners and that are working inside of some of the sectors that are represented by the groups that you've seen up there. So let's start with John Utek. John serves as the Senior Director of Cleveland Clinic's Office for a Healthy Environment. John, you there? You are. I see you. Great. Um, Great to be here. You're, the Great intersection, to let me just start by asking you this question, because the intersection of climate and health underscores the need for leadership in the healthcare community. And I'm wondering how that influences your decarbonization strategies. Certainly. Thank you so much. Pleased and honored to be here. Yeah, as a healthcare organization, Cleveland Clinic, our sustainability work is really firmly rooted in the idea that environmental health and human health are interlinked. And really we see climate change as the greatest environmental health threat of this century. It's already having a dramatic impact upon the health of our patients and the communities that we serve. So really as such, we see the, you know, taking on this challenge as a major health initiative that Cleveland Clinic wants to be a leader in. So making this better climate challenge commitment is really our means of taking leadership and proactively mitigating our carbon footprint, while we also make our facilities resilient to the impacts of climate change and educate our physicians and nurses to heal and be ready and harm, heal the harms from climate change. So we see this better climate challenge as an opportunity to lead the healthcare sector to a healthier future, and really something that can galvanize positive action for our physicians and our nurses and the people that clean our hospitals and really everyone within our organization. Healthcare is such a mission oriented and um, caring environment and it's been a tough couple years, but we see taking action as something that can really positively engage everyone in our healthcare organization towards a positive future. And, and Secretary, one of you talked about this as a leap of faith one of the reasons that Cleveland Clinic has confidence in making this leap of faith is that it isn't so much of a leap of faith for us. We've worked with the Department of Energy for more than a decade on the Better Buildings Challenge, and that commitment was a North Star. It's really a guiding principle, something that galvanized Cleveland Clinic both within our organization, something we could describe as a key commitment, all of our doctors and nurses and everyone who works within our buildings that, hey, the behaviors you take on a daily basis matter, and these technical investments that we've asked the organization to make all lead us towards making this energy efficiency improvement. And we experienced that the DOE's technical assistance that they provided on a variety of challenges that we faced, the creation of both toolkits and implementation models that we, we, we created some from our own experience and we imported those from others, made a huge difference in accelerating our progress and our achievement of the Better Buildings Challenge goal. So we're tremendously excited to be working with the Department of Energy because we see this as a group sport. And the only way we can do this is by working together. And we know that um, through our experience in achieving the previous decade's goal, we're, we look forward to the, the engagement model that the Better Buildings Challenge represents. And we found it really to be one of the most effective public-private partnerships that we've ever been a part of. So we're proud to be a charter member of this commitment and really looking forward to this being a major health impact throughout this decade. Well, let me just jump in here and, and thank you for that, uh, John. And uh, it, it's Gina McCarthy again. I wanted to, to jump. How are you, sir? It's good to see you. Hey, I just wanted to uh, jump over and, and see if Secretary uh, Ben Grumbles uh, from the state of Maryland wants to jump in here. 
I think everybody knows that Maryland is doing some terrific work, but he can speak, I think, more personally to some of the challenges that the states are seeing with their decarbonization strategies. But also, what are the opportunities, things like the bipartisan infrastructure law and the new money that's going to be able to be spent on infrastructure, what that means for states moving forward, opening up opportunities. Ben, it's good to see you. Great to see you, secretaries and uh, Gina, my dear friend. I'll uh, wave the flag. Uh, so I am the environment secretary for Governor Larry Hogan, and we're so proud of the partnerships and and uh, the work all of us are involved in. The bipartisan infrastructure law is truly a game changer for our climate and clean energy economy. And uh, I just would want to say that Maryland is so proud to be part of this effort. We we are, uh, according to ACEEE, the, the sixth best state in the country for energy efficiency policies and programs. And we have a goal, our greenhouse gas reduction goal, the governor's is uh, at least 50% by 2030. So this is a no brainer to be part of this very broad partnership and, and looking for new opportunities with uh, infrastructure and, and retrofits. And uh, I would also say that the Department of General Services, our Secretary Churchill, David St. Jean, who's been instrumental in the partnership with DOE, are leading us into a clean energy future. And uh, we're excited about that. Uh, we have uh, the most comprehensive database in the country for government operations, and we're using that to track our greenhouse gas reductions. So uh, as Gina, as a former state official knows, and the Secretary Granholm, uh, the states really lead the way with federal leadership and, and local and, and private sector leadership. And we are joined by 23 other states as part of the U.S. Climate Alliance and um, the Environmental Council of the States, the 50 state environmental secretaries. We're all gathering in, Nash in Asheville, uh, North Carolina in April with a focus on partnerships for results. So, you know, building uh, better buildings, better climate challenge, better together. And that's why we're so proud of this partnership. And Gina, I'll say partnership as well. It's great to be part of it. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. All right, Ben, love it. This is normally my role to, to dig Gina on her accent. So I appreciate the help on that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Forrester, who's the Executive Vice President for Environmental uh, and S Sustainability at Cleveland Cliffs. Tracy, um, so American manufacturing is absolutely critical to solving the climate crisis we know. So I wonder if at Cleveland Cliffs, where do you see the biggest openings to advance decarbonization in your plants and in your processes? Well, first, I want to start by thanking you, Secretary Granholm and National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy and the Department of Energy for allowing me the opportunity to speak briefly on behalf of Cliffs. Not only uh, is Cleveland Cliffs an inaugural member of the Better Climate Challenge, we're also a longstanding member of the Better Plants Program. Additionally, we're proud to partner with the DOE on numerous initiatives to advance decarbonization across our 60 plus operating facilities where we employ 26,000 employees, of which 70% are represented by the United Steelworkers, the United Auto Workers, and the International Association of Machinists. The American steel industry is already the cleanest and most energy efficient of the leading steel producers in the world. Due to aggressive decarbonization commitments, our sector will advance its status as the global leader in carbon efficient steel production. Cleveland Cliffs will continue to lead through innovative partnerships like the Better Climate Challenge. At Cliffs, we are taking action now to reduce our absolute scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. We are most excited to be implementing our closed loop steel recycling program where all of our hot metal contains 28% quality recycled steel. To illustrate, we make a coil of steel. We sell it to car manufacturers who use that steel to stamp a door ring. Through our recycling partnerships, we bring the excess scrap from that manufacturer right back into our furnaces to generate more steel. By using the clean materials mix domestically produced, we are a leader in low carbon intensity steel making today. Also, we're currently working with partners on a DOE funded study 
to evaluate potential future use of carbon capture technology for steel mills. We look forward to our continued work in partnership with the DOE to advance clean manufacturing and thank you both for the opportunity to highlight Cliffs and for your leadership. I think it's my turn to jump in and I'm trying to figure out how I can make fun of anybody, just like everybody's making fun of me, but I'll figure out a way. The, the thing that I do want to point out is I think that Cleveland has gotten enough attention. I mean, seriously, two out of three so far. Where's Boston? Um, uh, they, they're going to get in here somewhere. Uh, but having said that, uh, we, we'll, we'll give the floor to somebody who's neither talking about Cleveland nor Boston, but getting a little bit bigger and higher up than that. Um, I want to ask the next question uh, to Javier Quinones, who is the uh, CEO and Chief Sustainability Officer of, of uh, IKEA. And, I, you know, obviously, IKEA has been a leader in so many different ways, but it's going to be really interesting, I think, Javier, if you want to talk about all of your efforts already ongoing to reduce emissions, and how does that really underpin your efforts to have a sustainable business model? Thank you very much, uh, Gina, and uh, thanks, uh, Secretary, and uh, thanks to the Department of Energy for this initiative and uh, partnership. I feel uh, extremely honored uh, to be here, and it's great to see all these logos uh, growing and uh, many more uh, joining, because, of course, uh, I fully agree that this will only happen when we do it together, public, uh, private sectors, and, of course, uh, Everyone in general, there is only one way. For us, uh, it goes down to our uh, vision, which is to create a better life for the many people. We don't believe uh, that there is uh, any other way than offering a better life uh, to the many than really taking care of the home that we all share, which is uh, the planet. And that's uh, for us uh, what drives us. It's uh, part of who we are. It's part of our uh, DNA. And I still remember more than 20 years ago when I joined IKEA, I did my first sustainability uh, training. So it's not new. It's part of uh, who we are. And uh, we've been working uh, with this for a long time. Uh, part of our uh, guidance here, it's our um, people and planet uh, positive strategy. It's a long-term strategy and it is public. It is in our website for anyone uh, to have a look, uh, where we set the goals, uh, ambitious goals uh, for 2030 and uh, 2040 and 2050. And um, that's uh, one of the documents that guide us, but it's probably the leadership behind uh, that is connected to our DNA and uh, our vision. For us, it's important, uh, not what we do, but also how we do it. And uh, again, it's a part of uh, our DNA and how we want to uh, lead our business. We are fortunate that we are already in many people's uh, home in one way or another. And uh, we believe that it is uh, part of our responsibility to make sure that when people is using an IKEA product or families are enjoying an IKEA product, they know that they come from uh, sustainable sources, uh, delivered in a, a sustainable way, and that can be recycled or uh, giving a second life uh, to many more families. So uh, that gives us uh, a big responsibility, actually, in how uh, we interact with uh, many people uh, across the globe. So with that said, uh, I would like to say again, uh, massive thanks uh, for the leadership and uh, this initiative and uh, looking forward to uh, what we can do uh, together in the future. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Javier. I feel very close to IKEA, as I'm sure many on this do, having just finished assembled yet another couch. But anyway, it's so awesome to know that it, everything has been produced sustainably and delivered sustainably. And thank you for your leadership. So I have a question uh, now for Knoxville Mayor India Kincannon. Mayor Kincannon, I know you know better than anybody that cities, of course, are at the forefront of much of this work on decarbonization. I'm wondering how you're combining the work that you're doing around infrastructure with this focus on planning for the future. 
Uh, well, thank you. It's an honor to be here, Secretary Granholm. And I do want to uh, say that uh, cities around the country are very aware of these challenges and the infrastructure opportunities through the federal government are going to be a game changer for our sustainability efforts. And I would say it's where the rubber meets the road, but as I have the Tennessee River from my office, I'll say it's where the paddle meets the water. And this uh, better climate challenge where we have private sector, local, state and federal partners all working together, higher education, that helps us all paddle in, in coordination and with, with synchronicity and going in the same direction with good data to inform us the whole way. So I'm really thrilled to be part of this effort. Um, and action on climate is what the people of Knoxville and people in communities all around this country want to see data informed effective action to change this and mitigate these these serious climate uh, issues. So with that in mind, we're working to adjust systems and policies to support the kind of community growth our residents expect. During the first two years of my administration, I started the city's first climate council, and that has dozens of community leaders and technical experts to identify strategies to meet and often exceed our climate goals. And uh, the most important committee on that is the equity committee. Uh, so we make sure whether it's buildings, transportation, or waste, we're always uh, seeing these things through an equity lens. Um, so just since I've been mayor, we've taken significant steps to implement a vision zero approach to mobility. We're electrifying our fleets and revamping our public transit. We're investing local dollars to increase accessible and affordable and transit oriented uh, public charging, but also for private vehicles. Knoxville continues to stay above state energy code. And in 2019, we've totally revamped our zoning codes to support climate change adaptation by adopting landscaping requirements that would help address stormwater issues and combat the really serious heat island effect. On the building side of things, we look to supportive policies to guide development and, and the DOA, DOE has been a huge help in that regard. Our buildings are huge community assets and we're increasing energy efficiency through partnerships, bringing more than 1 million megawatts of solar online this year. Uh, so that's a, a pretty big number. I'm really proud of that. Uh, I really want to just give a shout out to Nate Allen, Paul Torsellini, and Mike Powers for helping Knoxville work through low carbon buildings. And we're going to be taking those lessons learned across our pro portfolio as we address all these uh, deferred maintenance needs. So we are so lucky in Knoxville to have great partners, especially DOE, as well as DOE sponsored Oak Ridge National Lab in our backyard. These teams provide hundreds of hours of insight and technical assistance to help our teams grow and improve. And again, I'm just so thrilled that Knoxville's an inaugural part of this Better Climate Challenge. The people here are thrilled and, and we couldn't do it without this uh, consortium of partners. Well, Maya, thank you for that. Uh, this is a really exciting uh, sort of forum to show just how important states are how important local government can be in this and how everybody needs to work together, the business sector and, and the health sector. You know, I just happen to work in most of those sectors at some point in my life because I'm old. So you get that variety in your life. But, but you know, the one thing that we haven't hit is something I think that uh, I can ask uh, President McConnell uh, from Colorado State University to address. And that is to make sure that we are looking at all of our institutions and the opportunities in higher ed are tremendous for two reasons. One is, I think there's opportunity because of the buildings and, and other features that they really can actively work to address in their investment strategies. But I think maybe even more importantly, it's, it's how we relate to the students. You know, there is no, uh, there is no community in the United States that's more active and engaged on climate than the young people are. And to be able to build that into our education system and respond to it effectively is I think a challenge that every higher education uh, outlet is looking at and certainly for presidents like uh, President McConnell. So President McConnell, why don't you just uh, address this issue and talk about the work you're doing in higher ed and, and how you're working with students to energize them to think about the future and the opportunities ahead because we see a lot of depressed young people these days and we need to boost them up and give them some hope. 
Well, thank you very much. I am so appreciative that you included the higher education sector. Um, often we, we don't get recognized for the enormous role we play, not just uh, in terms of educating our students, but also in terms of through our research finding solutions to huge challenges, but also as a major player in the economic sector. And so to be included in this is uh, really uh, wonderful. And thank you, Secretary Granholm and, and Advisor uh, McCarthy. I don't know that you well enough to call you Gina, I don't think, but everyone on my campus calls you Gina anyway. Um, <laughs> Colorado State University has a long-standing commitment to sustainability. So what we're talking about today is just part of a much bigger picture. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, maybe I'll call you Gina. Um, that's a little hard to do, but you're absolutely right that our students push us forward. Um, and not just our students, but also our staff and faculty. Um, we have had a long-term commitment to this, as I said. So Colorado State University is actually ranked number one in the United States um, for sustainability. So this is one piece of our sustainability efforts. We take this very seriously, not just in terms of our legacy as an institution, but the legacy that every one of our 32,000 students represents. Our students care deeply about climate change. We just went through a strategic planning process called Courageous Strategic Transformation. Um, and we have two focus areas, a thriving planet and a flourishing humanity. And we say that because we know um, that our, uh, the health and of our planet affects, deeply affects and governs the health of our people. And so we're focused not just on what's on happening on campus, but all of our research, our academics are focused on what it is we can do with our students to prepare them to be leaders in the future. Um, part of that leadership is also being creative. And I want to use one great example because it was a wonderful convergence of lots of great minds on campus. We had to uh, redo our soccer field. And so in the process of thinking about redoing our soccer field, our students and sustainability commission said, well, if we're gonna plow it up anyway, let's do a geothermal plant. So we dug up the soccer field, we put in a geothermal plant and it powers three enormous recreation buildings, including our basketball arena. Um, it covers all heating, all cooling, um, we have another plan just like that um, that we're working on. So this idea of the better climate change and better building challenge, um, we're really actively engaged in. The, the, this is such a positive and, and optimistic uh, panel, and I love the opportunity to share that optimism. I want to close on saying that one of the things that is extraordinary about working with students is they truly are optimistic and hopeful, and they want to play a critical role in making sure we meet these challenges as soon as possible. And so having them be our partners and knowing what they're going to be capable of doing in the future, having them partner with our researchers on climate solutions is really, really critical um, to constantly moving forward and finding solutions um, to the climate challenges that we face. So I want, I want to thank everyone on this call, but obviously really uh, deeply thankful to the secretary, to DOE, and to Gina McCarthy for everything that you're doing. Um, thank you for the partnership. All right. President McConnell, what a great uh, statement of our future workforce. Thank you for training them and for a su support for geothermal, which I am totally obsessed with. And I hope everybody on here explores the opportunity of doing geothermal because it is clean, dispatchable, baseload power that many people are not aware is right beneath our feet. So thank you so much. All right. You're I'm going to now we. Yes, you bet. So higher ed is in. Obviously, the private sector is in. The health community is in. Cities are in. States are in. I want to turn now 
to Morelio Leon, who is the CEO of the Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation, which develops and manages multifamily housing. And I'm wondering um, if you can tell us what opportunities you are most excited about in your efforts to decarbonize. Buenos dias, Secretary. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, and thank you really for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful initiative. Um, you know, when I look at our efforts um, to decarbonize, uh, I'm most excited about three really important components. Um, the first component actually is community health and wellness. Uh, we believe that health, uh, housing is health. And in order for decarbonization to really take hold and work, um, it really needs to be inclusive of low-income communities and communities of color um, who in many ways are more at risk um, of health inequities. Um, in California, uh, we are based out of San Francisco. Um, we've been facing a severe housing um, and housing insecurity for many years. Really, that jeopardizes the health and wellness of low-income communities and communities of color. You know, these are the same families um, suffering from housing insecurity and also um, are really faced with the impacts of climate change. Um, so to improve community health and wellness, um, innovative multi-housing models um, and investment in quality affordable housing is essential. Uh, the second component um, really to, is really advancing equity um, by building quality communities. Um, nationally, low-income communities spend three times more um, than non, on energy bills and utility bills uh, compared to non-low-income um, households. Um, and historically, um, they've had less access um, to energy efficiency services. Um, currently, for us in San Francisco, 80% of the community that we serve uh, earns less than $15,000 a year. $15,000 a year. Um, you know, this means that by building quality energy efficiency homes, um, we can really advance equity in a real way by supporting low-income families to spend less on utility costs and more on other basic essentials such as food, medicine, and healthcare. And lastly, um, I'm excited because of this partnership and being inclusive of, of all that these little magical squares allows us to connect with. You know, our decarbonization efforts would only be possible um, because of your leadership, the leadership of DOE, HUD, and others um, really that, that help guide our work as practitioners. Um, we, you know, we are tremendously thankful for your investments, uh, technical assistance, um, and without your work, we wouldn't be able to serve our communities. Um, so thank you uh, for including us in today's discussion. Oh my goodness, Morelio, thank you so much. You've really gotten me excited. I mean, what are we here for if we are not to make sure that people who have been at the back of the line should be at the front of the line. Thank you so much for representing justice and equity and giving us all um, some targets perhaps to uh, focus our efforts. I hope everybody feels the same way. So I said it earlier and it's true, there's a lot of potential uh, here, thanks to all of our inaugural partners. And I wanna say thank you once again for your leadership and your partnership with DOE. Our team is looking forward to hosting you all in person at the Better Buildings Summit in May. Um, we're gonna be convening work, uh, working groups on these topics, and we're gonna be convening, um, you know, discussing the challenges and the barriers and the opportunities that um, are being raised, that you have raised. And we're gonna to continue to shape that summit based on your input over the months ahead. So we're excited to hit the ground running, seeing these partnerships take hold so we got a lot of work to do. We got a big problem to solve. Let's get do it. Let's let's get to it. Let's roll up our sleeves and we'll see you in May. Thank you everybody for participating.